Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's very nice to see you. My name is Sunshine Menezes. I'm the executive director of Metcalf Institute, and we're really glad that you could join us today. The University of Rhode Island's Metcalf Institute has been fostering informed public conversations about science and the environment since 1998. We take a variety of approaches to this work. Um, we offer science training for professional journalists, such as our annual science immersion workshop for journalists, which will um, continue again this summer. We offer communication training for scientists across career stages from undergraduates through professionals. We organize the Inclusive SciComm Symposium, which brings together a wide range of students and professionals from across the country to make science, and science communication more inclusive and equitable. And we offer public events like this one, as well as our annual public lecture series, which will be held June 14 to 18 this year. Today, I'm thrilled to note that this lecture is the first of two Leeson lectures that we'll be offering in 2021. These lectures honor Rob Leeson Jr., one of Metcalf Institute's longest serving advisory board members. Rob has been an incredible advocate for our work. To honor that service and advocacy, a group of more than 140 donors came together in 2019 to fund the Robert Leeson Jr. Lecture. Although the original plan was to support a single Leeson lecture each year, the donor's generosity has allowed us to support two events. Rob's goals for Metcalf Institute as a board member, and even now as an emeritus board member, have always been to increase national awareness of our work and to build Metcalf's donor base. By endowing the Leeson lectures, those donors have ensured that we will be able to honor Rob, advance his goals for Metcalf Institute, and bring inspiring speakers together to achieve the informed public conversations we seek. Thank you, Rob, for your dedication to Metcalf Institute's mission, and thank you to everyone who donated to make the Leeson lectures possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Jody Freeman. Professor Freeman is the Archibald Cox Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. She's a leading scholar of administrative and, and environmental law and has written extensively about climate change, environmental regulation, and executive power. She served as counselor for energy and climate change in the Obama White House, where she designed the president's historic agreement with the auto industry to double fuel efficiency standards and set the first federal greenhouse gas standards under the Clean Air Act. Known for her early work on public-private approaches to regulatory problems, she's been recognized as the second most cited scholar in public law in the nation. She's a member of a number of groups, including the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American College of Environmental Lawyers, and a member on the Council on Foreign Relations. Now, as the Biden administration shapes its approach to climate regulations and policy, and various factions in Congress, prepare to push for their preferred policy solutions. We're excited to hear Professor Freeman's insights on the current state of US climate policy and where we might be headed, especially given the administration's focus on addressing racial and socioeconomic inequities. So with that, I welcome Professor Freeman. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm just delighted to join you all. Um, I know it's a challenge on Zoom to hold all of these kinds of events and to have them be dynamic. So my goal is to talk for just a little while and then take your questions and see if we can have a kind of exchange as a way of um, covering the many issues that uh, have arisen um, on climate change, energy policy, environmental protection in the early days of the Biden administration. So let me frame what I hope will be that discussion with just a few remarks about where we are now with uh, President Biden and his team. And in order to do, that, to do that, I have to give you a little bit on where we were uh, most recently. If you recall that Trump administration in its four years really embarked on a campaign of dismantling all of the environmental protection measures and in particular the climate regulation measures that the Obama administration had put in place. So we saw in the Trump years, really a historic unraveling of environmental protection and climate policy. And it's important to know that because the Biden administration will have to rebuild back to where the Obama team left off and it has promised to go beyond. So some of the things the Biden administration has promised include decarbonizing the electricity sector, meaning the power that 
fuels your cell phones and TVs and all of our appliances and basically daily life, that electricity should be delivered with no carbon emissions by 2035, meaning the sources will have to be all clean energy sources. That's a remarkable uh, commitment and aspiration. The administration also has said that it wants to achieve net zero emissions from the US economy by 2050, another very ambitious goal. And there are a variety of promises and aspirations that the administration has put on the table in two very important executive orders that President Biden signed in the first couple of weeks in office. One of those orders very systematically details the kinds of carbon regulations and environmental protections that the administration will be putting in place. Some of it will be building back again from the Trump administration's unraveling, but some of it will go forward. And I'll just give you a couple of examples of the things that the president committed to in these executive orders he signed. For example, putting back in place rules to control methane emissions from oil and gas operations that Trump rescinded putting back in place standards that will gradually improve the fuel efficiency and reduce the carbon emissions of new cars and trucks, which the Trump administration badly weakened. Um, and things of that nature that represent regulatory measures to reduce carbon in various sectors of the economy. The other thing that the executive orders have promised to do is feature environmental justice concerns much more prominently in environmental protection. And we can talk more about that in question and answer, but the Biden administration has gone beyond any prior administration in making the pursuit of environmental justice, which essentially is about fairness and about relieving low-income and minority communities, which we sometimes call EJ communities, but relieving them of the disproportionate burdens they have historically suffered from environmental harms. That agenda is, more prominent in this administration's plans than any other uh, administration before it. I'll just note that one of the executive orders refers to environmental justice 24 times. That's just an indication of its prominence. And we can talk in more detail about how the administration seeks to embed concerns about fairness and equality and justice in its environmental and climate agenda. Uh, so just to be clear, these two executive orders are about number one, replacing strong regulation that was uh, dismantled. And number two, going forward and being able to commit to the international community that the United States is back, that it wants to be a leader on climate change. And with that in mind, of course, the administration almost immediately rejoined the Paris Agreement and has said that it is going to host, of course, coming up on Earth Day, an international summit ahead of the meeting of all the parties to that Paris Agreement, which will take place in Glasgow in November, the next international meeting. So there is a process in place led by, as you all know, John Kerry as the president's envoy on climate change to put the US back in a leadership role to try to drive international negotiations on climate change forward. While at the same time, the president has put Gina McCarthy in charge. Gina McCarthy is the former administrator of the EPA and the Obama administration to put her in charge of the domestic agenda to put regulations back in place to deal with carbon emissions in the US economy. Now I'm saying all this as if the president can do anything the president wants on environmental policy and climate change, but it's not true. So the last thing I'll say to you by way of introduction is, there are some things a president can do and there are some limits on what a president can do. What a president's able to do is implement existing law. So the Clean Air Act, which regulates pollution, including greenhouse gas pollution, is something that Biden with his agencies like EPA can implement. And so he can adopt regulations like the ones I mentioned to you, controlling methane emissions on private and public land, uh, setting fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks, and arguably setting standards for the power sector to control their emissions. So there are some things the president can do using existing law to implement rules um, without going to Congress for any kind of approval. But what he can't do is create a brand new climate initiative that isn't authorized by existing law. So for example, the president couldn't implement a carbon tax all by himself. For that, you need the Congress to pass new legislation. 
And we don't seem to see on the horizon uh, really political space for an ambitious new climate bill that would cap carbon in the US economy or put in place a carbon tax, for example. And we can talk about that too in question and answer, but we don't really see at the moment the prospect of that kind of legislation. So the president will be using the laws on the books to try to use a, every agency of the federal government that he can exercise discretion over to maximize the regulation of carbon in the US economy. But there will be some limits on that in the absence of a new law. At the same time, he will be trying to push the international community by deploying United States diplomacy in the, in the person primarily of John Kerry at the moment to lead that effort. And so he has a domestic agenda, an international agenda, but Congress is not the main player at the moment on climate policy. I'll just say one more thing about Congress and then I'll actually open up to questions. Congress is doing two things at the moment. One is spending a lot, investing a lot, uh, partly to address the economic consequences of COVID, but also we anticipate seeing a multi-trillion dollar investment in infrastructure, which I think will likely pass. And that has in it a lot of green spending, spending on renewable energy support, tax credits, grants, loans, expenditures, that are going to be part of this infrastructure bill and are going to help spur clean energy development. So I see that spending package on infrastructure as climate policy in part. That's the way the administration is going to try to accomplish part of its policy agenda through spending. Uh, and the other thing uh, Congress is possibly going to do maybe is consider a clean energy standard. I give that kind of low chances of passing. That would be like, creating a national renewable portfolio standard, which you see in uh, the majority of states already have adopted. There's some possibility of Congress adopting that, but I think it's rather slim. So I think most of the action you can look forward to is executive branch action led by the White House, using the agencies of the federal government like the Environmental Protection Agency, but also all of the agencies, even suspects you don't normally think of. The Department of Treasury, which has influence over financing international projects, will be paying attention to trying to promote greener projects, right? The US Department of Agriculture will be using its allocation of funds, its spending authority and discretion to try to find ways to incentivize improved farming practices and sequestration practices. And across the board, including the military, the administration has laid out a whole of government agenda to use the powers it has to drive climate policy forward. But again, I don't expect to see big action in Congress, at least in the near future. So with that framing of the powers that can be deployed and the Biden administration's ambitious agenda, um, let me open it up to all of you, and I'm happy to answer any questions in this entire domain. Thank you so much, Professor Freeman, for those introductory remarks. So um, this is already inspiring some questions, no surprise. Um, one of the first ones that I see here is from Bonnie, who asks, I'm curious as to how effective we will be in assuring the world community that the U.S. is back, knowing how quickly these things can, apparently, be torn apart in a new election. So how do we build this trust in the US commitment to, to climate action? Yeah, it's a great question. You, you're really getting at a, a complicated problem, uh, which I, I think is worth spending just a few minutes on. And that is that regulations adopted by agencies like EPA or the Department of the Interior or the Department of Energy or Department of Transportation, that regulations they adopt can be undone by a new administration. And that we have seen over time these pendulum shifts from usually from Republican to Democratic administration. The shift under Trump was more dramatic than any we've seen. He went further and deeper and seemed more committed to unraveling than any prior administration, at least in the environmental protection and climate policy realm. But it's all part of a pretty consistent history of pendulum swinging as the question suggests. And the reason that's possible is that rules aren't law. <laughs> Regulations are administrative products, if you will. You know, they're binding. They're binding like they're law, but they're temporary and can be reversed by a new rule. So 
it's not automatic and administration has to go through a quite time consuming process to rescind a rule and put one a new one in place it's called notice and comment rulemaking it's a legal process step by step that requires the agency to propose a new rule take comment on the new rule then justify all the decisions it's making in terms of the stringency of the rule and who it affects and the compliance around the rule. The agency also has to run this proposal through the White House and provide a very detailed cost benefit analysis and then come out with a final rule. And I'm giving you all this detail just to communicate to you that it's actually quite elaborate. And it doesn't happen over a period of months, it typically happens over a period of years. So not only do we see pendulum shifts, but they take a long time. And it's, it's procedurally burdensome. It consumes a lot of the government's resources to do this, to change rules over one administration to another. And so what's the logical reaction to this? It's why doesn't Congress just adopt the rules in a law? Why don't they pass legislation which would be more durable because it's harder for Congress to come back and amend legislation and it's less frequent. So you think of durability, you think law, 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 Congress should pass it. The trouble is that in the modern regulatory era, Congress has been quite inactive. Congress, I said this on a call earlier today, Congress seems to be able to do two things. One is cut your taxes. Uh, and so tax policy is something Congress could do. And the other is spend a bunch of money. But in terms of um, substantive law to address a host of societal problems, ranging from privacy, we don't have a national privacy law in this country, to a modern uh, uh, set of rules to govern the internet, which we don't have in this country, to, for a modern set of rules for cybersecurity, which we don't have in this country, a modern set of rules for climate change, which we don't have in this country. Congress has seemed incapable of passing substantive legislation like that. And to put a fine point on it, we have not seen a major environmental law adopted by Congress in the United States since 1990. That's when the latest, the most recent amendments to the Clean Air Act were adopted, 30 years plus of relative inactivity by Congress. It's very hard to adapt old laws to new problems. And agencies of the government basically are entrusted with these laws to implement them. And they have to kind of struggle to adapt them through interesting creative interpretation to new problems. And so the, this is a long answer to your question, but it's by way of saying, yeah, the pendulum shifts are a problem, but they're needed because Congress has been relatively inactive. Thank you. Oh, wait, um, I, I, sorry, I have to say, I actually think the question was, how are we going to assure the international community? And the short, the short answer to that is, we have to do our best given the fact that they also know we shift policy administration to administration. And the way we do our best is we re-engage forcefully in the, and the way the president's approach this is he made very high level appointments. John Kerry is a former secretary of state and senator. The message to the international community is, we're not sending you some functionary. We're sending you somebody who you used to deal with as secretary of state, who is identified very closely with the climate issue. We're putting Gina McCarthy, a former cabinet member in the White House to coordinate domestic policy. The signals they're sending are the way they reassure the international community. Thank you, that's very helpful. <clears throat> Building on the comments you were just making about the, uh, the, the um, function of agencies and this, this laborious process, mm -hmm. Reiner asks, um, support and funding for the EPA has been on the decline for decades. So Congress can spend, <laughs> they can appropriate, but the funding has to actually be put in there into the appropriations bills. Is it realistic? for EPA to play any major role in combating climate change and enforcing regulations, given its limited funding, its decimated workforce and possibly tanking morale? Yeah, another great question. And I, I will just uh, selfishly self promote for a moment. I just finished writing an article which responds to this question, which is called structural deregulation, which is really a chronicle of all the ways the Trump administration, but not just the Trump administration, all the ways any president can systematically undermine the capacity of the federal government by things like proposing to underfund, 
um, uh, leading and encouraging staff attrition, failing to appoint key posts, undermining science, sidelining expertise, and destroying morale. So your question could not be more at the heart of what I'm interested in at the moment, and it's, it's dead on. Agencies can be incapacitated through all of these relatively invisible ways, underfunded, undermined, understaffed. And I think part of the Biden administration's project is to rebuild the capacity of those agencies. You know, again, in these two very important executive orders that Biden put out, which are really worth looking at, go to whitehouse.gov and go find, it's very easy to find the climate change and environmental protection executive orders. You see mention after mention of the importance of science, of how uh, regulation will be based on science again, expertise again, the administration has proposed a budget. The president always proposes a budget around this time of year. Of course, the president may not get everything in his budget. Congress has to appropriate. But by proposing the budget, the president sets the kind of parameters for negotiation over the budget. And he's proposed to refund many agencies that were badly undermined during the Trump years, including EPA. So I think a restoration of funding is likely on its way. Restoration of staffing is already happening. The early appointments have been uh, really high level experienced people who were put in place right away in these agencies as acting officials before Senate confirmation so they could take the reins quickly and get policy moving even while we're waiting for nominees to be named and conf confirmations to happen. And you also see, by the way, historic diversity in these appointments. Wonderful uh, set of appointments to the Council on Environmental Quality, Brenda Mallory, Deb Hallen, going to be the Secretary of the Interior, uh, first Native American um, Secretary of the Interior with roots, um, deep roots uh, in these issues that have to do with tribes, as well as you know, all the traditional issues that the DOI deals with in the West. Um, Michael Regan, uh, first African American man to lead the EPA. I mean, this, this is a wonderful set of appointments um, that um, sends a signal about both deep expertise and, and uh, diversity. So I take all of this to be, we're back domestically. We're gonna rebuild these agencies uh, domestically. It'll take a little bit of time, but I think that's, uh, I think the answer to your question is yes, EPA can enforce regulation. Yes, EPA is equipped to do it, uh, but it requires uh, rebuilding somewhat, which the administration I think is committed to doing. Great, so um, let's turn now to a few more Congress focused questions. Connie asks, given the greater longevity of law, it would seem advisable to pass appropriate laws now while the Democrats have more power than usual in Congress. How likely is a push for that in the next two years? Well, you're right. It would seem, lot of things seem reasonable but aren't politically possible. And that's always the bad news I deliver. Um, uh, the Democrats are very marginally in control, right? By one vote, which is the tie-breaking vote that the Vice President Kamala Harris exercises. 51 to 50 is not enough to pass substantive legislation given the filibuster rule, which allows, um, uh, which allows a blocking legislation unless you can get 60 votes to end the filibuster. So effectively to pass any law, you effectively need to attract 60 votes because you have to anticipate a filibuster. It's quite unlikely that climate, environmental, natural resource, any law to do with these issues could get over the 60 vote margin and attract that many Republicans and Democrats, moderate Democrats, to support, say, a carbon tax or to support, support a cap on carbon and a, a, fee, a trading system for uh, um, allowances underneath it. Any of these measures um, is going to have a very hard time. And it's not just because most Republicans would oppose it. It's really important to remember that there are moderate Democrats who also come from energy states, traditional energy states. And the best example of this is Joe Manchin of West Virginia, a Democrat, a loyal Democrat who supports Biden and supports his infrastructure agenda, for example and uh, his covert recovery effort, for example, but who is from a coal state and who wants to protect his constituency and his population from what they anticipate to be 
a, a very dislocating transition to cleaner energy economy. And Manchin, uh, who is, you know, the vote in the Senate that leads to 50, right? You need Manchin, is very unlikely to support an aggressive climate bill. So the, rea the political realities are the political realities, and that is why um, it's not likely we'll see a bill in Congress uh, in the near future. Uh, and we're likely to see more happen through executive power, through rules and regulations, as I discussed. I'll say one more thing about that. Yeah, I'll say one yes. more thing about that, which is, I know many of you know this, but it's still worth saying, climate change and energy policy, they're not like other issues. They don't quite fall out on ideological lines, the R's and the D's. You can't quite tell what people think just because they're an R or a D. It has to do with regionally where they're from and what the resource endowment is of their state. You know, so Chuck Grassley, a Republican, is very supportive of wind because there's a lot of wind in his state. You know, Texans may be very supportive of uh, renewable energy support and investment because they got a ton of wind also. So it, the R's and the D's don't quite tell you the story. Or Manchin's a great example, a Democrat, but from a coal state. So where you fall on climate energy policy has much more to do with the resource endowment of your state than it does with the simple political affiliation of your party. And that helps account for why Obama couldn't get uh, a climate bill, you know, the American Clean Energy um, and Security Act, ACEs, uh, couldn't get through the Senate when the Democrats controlled the House, the Senate, and the presidency in the first Obama term. Uh, still couldn't pass uh, climate legislation to cap carbon. So that, that tells you how tough this is politically. Um, well, so this then leads to a couple of questions we've gotten about the, the infrastructure bill, which you mentioned, or the, the, you know, the pending efforts on infrastructure, yeah. which you mentioned. Yeah. Um, no bill yet, I guess. But um, what are the aspects of, of the Biden administration's infrastructure ideas and or any ideas that are circulating in Congress right now that you think are um, especially beneficial for climate and or which you think are especially likely to maybe bridge some of these, these gaps that you were just talking about, these regional distinctions? Yeah, so this is, there's a lot of money in the infrastructure proposal. I'm gonna get my billions wrong. If I say these numbers, they'll be wrong. You'll, you'll fact check me, but I wanna say something like $175 billion for electric vehicle related expenditures, meaning charging infrastructure, batteries, and uh, incentives to purchase and to sell electric or hybrid electric vehicles. I think if I'm right, it's 175 billion, um, even if I'm off in my figure, it's an enormous amount of money compared to past expenditures. So that's just one example. Um, investments in the transmission grid to upgrade the transmission grid um, and to hopefully build more high voltage lines interstate lines and local lines that will help bring renewable power to the load centers, the population centers that consume energy, uh, that consume electricity. Investments like that in the old grid that needs a lot of help being rebuilt for the 21st century, in new infrastructure for transportation electrification, and in things like the investment tax credit and production tax credit, which help to support renewable energy development and deployment, more wind, more solar, et cetera. That's the kind of spending you're seeing, spending on batteries, spending on storage, energy storage, the kinds of technology and, um, uh, and um, uh, both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, if you will, the data uh, support, the kind of smart grid uh, idea, the kind of intelligence you need to, to use both demand response to reduce demand from the grid and integrate um, energy efficiency. That's, that's not always hard wires. That's not always hard infrastructure. Sometimes it's advanced data analytics and, um, and software. But all of those kinds of investments I expect to see in the infrastructure bill. It's not regulatory. It's not a prohibition on emitting carbon, right? That, the infrastructure bill isn't gonna tell people to stop. 
what it's going to do is finance, incentivize, grant loan support, the transition to cleaner energy. So it's one side of the equation. The other side is the regulation of emissions. But this is, this is the uh, incentive side of it. And I think the infrastructure bill is going to have a lot of spending um, that you would consider green stimulus spending. So building, we got this question as you were talking. So kind of building on exactly what you just said, um, Bob Semple noted the- um, Bob Semple. Bob Semple is here. Simple. <laughs> That's funny, okay. Um, we have a history, Bob Semple and I have a history, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he, he notes, he appreciates the importance of restoring and even strengthening the Obama regs, um, but don't we need Congress and its purse strings to underwrite this electrification of everything in sight, as he noted it, um, regarding clean yeah. power? So the investment is crucial, keeping in mind especially that we have only 30 years until mid-century, which is when so many of these goals are based. Yeah. Well, I'll just repeat that, yes, Congress is essential, and we all wish Congress would pass a comprehensive economy-wide approach to controlling emissions. And it could do that a number of ways, right? It's not a mystery. You, you don't have to be a genius. You either tax the thing you don't like, carbon, in order to drive it down, or you mandate a cap on it. And you say, we can't emit more than X in our economy. And then you distribute to the different sectors of the economy how much they're allowed to emit. And you gradually ramp that down over time and you make them pay for it. And maybe you take the revenue from selling these carbon allowances and you distribute it back to all of us in the form of a rebate, right? Or maybe you do something else with the money. You invest in clean technology, but, but sure, we all wish Congress would do this. And what's what's frustrating is that it seems like we have a hyper-polarized, hyper-partisan Congress that on top of the hyper-partisanship can't seem to agree on carbon policy, on climate policy, other than spending. So that's where we are right now. And I think what the Biden administration is smartly doing is saying, well, if they're willing, if we if we can put an infrastructure package together, let's load that package up with as much climate and energy policy as we can, and then we'll come back another day and we'll try to get the other stuff, which is the the capping part, the regulatory part. And what they're hoping is that Congress is willing to stimulate in investment, to underwrite investment, to get the R and D flowing that the market isn't willing to do by itself. So. I think they're doing, Bob, I think they're doing, you know, the administration's working with what it's got. I mean, they're, I'll just as a side comment stimulated by Bob's point. I do think the Biden team is really, really sophisticated. Like they know their way around the politics of this and they're not wasting any time. And they're putting this infrastructure bill through the reconciliation process, meaning they only need 51 votes and they can avoid the filibuster rule because reconciliation is this process, this fast track legislative process reserved for raising revenue and spending revenue. And so they're putting policy in that form so that they can get it over the line quickly into a law. I think they're managing the levers of government about as well as they can be managed at the moment. Look, well, let's take this outside of the beltway for a few questions then. Um, we have a couple really interesting ideas or questions here about um, how other people outside of government can be involved in this. Claudia asks um, about your sense of the dynamics between grassroots action, meaning also states and localities and private companies and the resistance and she wrote oil companies, question mark, coal country, question mark, um, to, to those efforts. So do you see some significant change in the balance of power between pro and con forces on climate policy outside of DC? What a great question. Uh, and I think I'll take a little time on it because you're touching on a number of things. First, let me say something that goes back to the Green New Deal. Um, if you recall the Green New Deal, it was sort of announced as a resolution uh, by AOC and other partners like Ed Markey in, um, in Congress. It wasn't a law, it wasn't a proposal for a law. 
it was an expression of a set of values and ambitions around decarbonizing the economy, but also doing so in a way that would bring good jobs. So it had, and, and it had environmental justice embedded it, with it. So it was both a, a green blue coalition. It was a kind of expression of a wish for a healthier economy and a fairer economy and a decarbonized economy. And the Green New Deal was seen as, you know, this aspiration that you could never get it through as a piece of legislation, but it wasn't designed as a, as a piece of legislation. And what it did was it framed the issues for the Democratic campaign. If you remember when Biden was running and all the other candidates were running for the Democratic nomination, they were forced to respond to this. And they, in a good way, they were forced to say, what are our plans for climate change? And this is because of young people and, um, uh, and progressives in the party who push this agenda. And I've said before, I, in an earlier interview, I acknowledged that you know when the Green New Deal was first unveiled, I didn't really fully grasp the force that it would have, the, the power it would have, because at it, it, the start, it was somewhat unformed. Um, it wasn't a fully developed proposal, so I was waiting for the fully developed proposal, like any good law professor. But as it turned out, it was a political vehicle, a very effective political vehicle, and it mobilized support and it helped to give voice to a set of very important concerns and they got taken up in the campaign. And now you see in the Biden um, agenda that's expressed in these executive orders the president has signed a very important pieces of what the Green New Deal was trying to do. And that is to both move in a cleaner, greener direction while also protecting jobs, while also improving fairness and equality and redressing inequality. That's a really hard thing to do all at the same time, but that's the ambition of the administration. And so I give a lot of credit to, you say outside the beltway, I give a lot of credit to young people, progressives who sort of went on the march to say these issues really matter to us. Um, I do also think, and this may um, be uncomfortable for some folks, I do also think there's a lot of good corporate leadership happening on these issues, quite apart from what the government's doing. I think you see leading companies say they have their own renewable energy goals, they're going to source their own wind and solar power so that they operate free of fossil energy. You see them setting sustainability standards. You see them setting targets for themselves quite independently of whatever the government requires them to do. And I think that's really important to have corporate leadership saying we have our own obligations and our own commitments. And they're driven to do it by their shareholders. They're driven to do it by their employees. Many of them are young, of a different generation, and they want to work somewhere that embodies their values. And the companies are responding to stakeholder pressure. Too. So there is a lot happening in the private sector that's worth paying attention to and supporting. And I would just encourage people not to paint all of the energy industry with the broad brush. Um, I understand the historic um, failures of parts of the energy industry to take climate change seriously. And, and to some extent, some of the companies, of course, have been implicated in the worst kind of undermining of science. And are rightly criticized um, and faulted for these really, really terrible actions, misleading the public on the science. But there are components of the energy industry now undergoing a very important transition and they deserve some, some support for their efforts in that regard. You see some of the big oil companies are trying to pivot and thinking about their business model and what they're going to invest in for the future. And they ought to be encouraged to do that, ought to be encouraged in that work. Um, it's going to be hard to get through an energy transition unless you engage with the energy sector. And so I know that's not the most popular thing to say, but I think it's very important um, to try to support the good actors, the leaders, uh, and, and encourage them to bring along the laggards. So this is a long answer to what's happening outside the Beltway, but there's a lot happening in the uh, activist, uh, youth, progressive community. There's a lot happening in the corporate 
community. Uh, there's a lot happening in the financial community. Financial institutions, banks, lenders, insurance companies, ratings agencies are all pressing for more disclosure from companies on their climate-related risk. And all of that pressure, it's not coming from the government, right? It's coming from other actors in society and in the economy, and it's all to the good. Great. A um, couple questions are, uh, are focusing on um, different energy sources. Um, so uh, Rebecca asked which sectors might be leading in arriving and bringing us toward a successful, a successful shift in more than 50% reliance on cleaner energy. Um, and Brett asked, um, there are many people who are apprehensive about nuclear energy, but do you feel that its benefits would be able to outweigh its drawbacks? Would nuclear energy be a good way to bridge the gap as we attempt to move towards net zero emissions? Yeah, so it's funny how nuclear energy's um, uh, profile has changed and popularity or unpopularity has changed as it became identified somewhat less with the dangers of a nuclear accident or nuclear waste and became identified somewhat more with the fact that it's carbon free. Uh, and the environmental community, which has long opposed nuclear energy, has done something of a reassessment. Uh, given its carbon-free benefits, its, its benefits for climate change. Uh, I'll answer with a slight dodge, which is to say, I don't see nuclear being a major player in the United States because of the long, deep-seated, uh, long-standing opposition um, in this country. Currently, nuclear energy, we, about 20% of our energy is supplied by nuclear power plants. And they're getting older and older. They're being retired. We're going to have to find a way to replace them. Uh, and, and they provide baseload power, which means consistent, constant power, which is very important when you have intermittent sources like wind and solar. And until you have really good storage, they will remain intermittent. So the loss of nuclear will be very uh, destabilizing for um, US electricity supply. But where I see nuclear growing is around the world. You see it in China, you see it, in, you see it everywhere. Um, France, of course, is almost entirely, I think, nuclear. Um, and so there will be parts of the world where this, this source of energy will be hugely important. I'm just not uh, convinced it will be in the United States. Um, the, the other, was there another part to that question? Was it mostly just about the role of complaint? Yeah, yeah. Well, so one person was asking about what are the, the different sources that could get us uh, kind of oh, yes. over the hump, right. and then the second part was about nuclear specifics. So, I mean, I, I think there's um, an effort to pursue uh, a whole variety of energy sources because there's, rather than picking a winner, um, you know, trying to support, this, for example, decide what cars will be powered by, there's a move to electrification. There's a sense that there will, vehicles will be largely electrified, but there might be a breakthrough in hydrogen technology. We may see hydrogen powered vehicles. I think this administration is trying a kind of, you know, all of the above policy, which is, we want to stimulate and incentivize um, innovation and not determine exactly where the market will go. But anybody working in the electricity sector today will tell you that wind and solar are a crucial part of the future. Um, energy storage will be absolutely critical to support them. Uh, for some time, there will be a need for natural gas to also provide baseload for these intermittent sources. Um, and so the, one of the disputes is about how long do you remain dependent on natural gas, which is of course a fossil fuel. It's about half as polluting as um, most people say about half as polluting as coal, for example, but it's still a fossil fuel. So the question really isn't which one, the question is which collection of sources and how quickly can you transition from a kind of baseload dependence on some fossil energy. And that is, uh, something that will happen over time in the electricity sector. But think about this. If you electrify the transportation fleet, if you're busy electrifying cars and trucks, and you also want to electrify building heating, you want to get rid of natural gas in buildings, you've just burdened the grid with more demand. So how do you keep cutting emissions on the grid while you electrify all these sectors of the economy? That's a, that's a challenging prospect. And it'll have to do with lots of things like demand response, cutting demand, um, energy efficiency, 
Um, so efficient electrification is the watchword. You don't just electrify everything, you efficiently electrify everything. So the short answer to this question is, all of these renewable sources, non-fossil sources will be required. In addition, we'll need a lot of storage and we'll need a lot of flexibility in how we manage the grid. The transportation sector is really hard. We are, we are almost 100% dependent on oil in, to fuel our cars and trucks and buses and fleets and airplanes. And that's harder than the electricity sector because there isn't right now a ready substitute for all of that transportation fuel. So in part you electrify and for the parts you can't electrify in transportation, you find other substitutes. Long answer, but that's why I left lots of time for questions. Um, no, these are great long answers. You're giving us a, a lot more detail to work with and that's wonderful. Um, all right, I'm gonna come back to um, uh, regulating carbon dioxide emissions question for a minute. And this I think yeah. is right up your alley. Hal asks, since the Supreme Court decided that CO2 is an air pollutant, couldn't EPA implement cap and trade for CO2 emissions? Um, and when might the Supreme Court hear that argument? So another great question, which will lead to yet another long answer. So um, quite right, the Supreme Court in probably the most famous environmental law case ever called Massachusetts versus EPA held that greenhouse gases are pollutants under the Clean Air Act. And why does that matter? Because if they're pollutants, they can be regulated by EPA under the Clean Air Act, um, just like EPA regulates other pollution. And EPA is allowed under that law to set standards for air pollution coming from cars and trucks and other transportation. And EPA is also allowed, in fact, required to set air pollution standards, including for greenhouse gases, for other sectors of the economy when those pollutants pose a danger to health or welfare. And EPA concluded that greenhouse gases do pose a danger to health or welfare, so they can regulate them coming from power plants. They can regulate them coming from oil and gas operations and on it goes through the economy. So yes, EPA can set standards for carbon emissions from power plants, but here's what it can't do. There's no explicit authority in the Clean Air Act to set up a cap and trade system. And if EPA tries to do it, they'll likely run into some trouble in the courts. And so EPA has to go industry by industry, sector by sector and set standards. That's not always the most efficient way to do things. Better to say, here's the total cap. You people decide who needs these allowances. You can buy and sell and trade them. And that would lead to efficient cutting of emissions among the companies that find it least costly to cut, they'll cut. And they'll sell their allowances to the companies that have a harder time cutting. And you'll get the emission reduction, but it'll be efficient. And the, that's the theory of cap and trade. EPA doesn't explicitly have the authority to do that. So that's the problem of a statute, a law, that was drafted in a particular way that didn't imagine doing cap and trade for climate change in this explicit way that EPA needs the authority. So I can say more about the Supreme Court. I'll, I'll, I'll just say one thing about the Supreme Court. I say this a lot that President Trump's legacy on environment, energy, climate, and related topics, the most powerful part of the legacy is probably the three new justices on the Supreme Court who are as uh, in general, it's fair to say skeptical of ambitious regulation unless it is explicitly very clearly author, authorized by language in the text of the law. Often laws are more vague and general and not as explicit as we wish them to be. And historically agencies are given some room, some latitude to interpret vague or general statements in law. And agencies are given some deference to implement some ambiguities in the law. And these three justices along with some others on the Supreme Court are deeply skeptical of that kind of deference to agencies. And they demand that Congress give them very, very clear instructions, which very rarely happen. And so the upshot is, if you want to propose an ambitious rule and you're relying on some interpretive flexibility to do it, you're going to run into some trouble in the Supreme Court. And that is the big threat hanging over the Biden administration. 
which is that they will wind up facing a legal challenge for any major climate rule they adopt. And if that legal challenge gets taken up by the Supreme Court, they are going to face a very skeptical set of justices. And that means you play keep away. You try to keep away from the Supreme Court to the extent you can. You try to build the best record possible for all your regulations that is bulletproof. And you try to be quite conservative, maybe. This is a debate going on in the administration. How conservative to be when you interpret the statute? How much to lean in? and how much risk to take. And that the Supreme Court is out there as a kind of, um, uh, as a risk. And what, what the administration is doing now is risk assessment on how ambitious to be. Uh, this is fascinating. I just, <laughs> I am absolutely um, loving all of these insights. So thank you. Um, so we've had no surprise, given the fact that this webinar is hosted by Metcalf Institute, we have a few questions here about climate communication. And um, so I'm, I'm going to try to wrap them all up into kind of a, an overarching question. So um, the, I guess these mostly relate to um, what, how can we, you know, as, as constituents out here in the world, push for climate policy. Um, what are, what are the, the talking points that you think are especially effective um, in, um, in communicating about these, um, these equitable um, big picture shifts that are, that are on, the, on the move? And also a little bit more specifically, um, Tom Henry, who's a reporter in the Great Lakes, said, you know, here we have Earth Day on Thursday. Um, would love to be able to have some, some great take home messages in Earth Day reporting um, on Thursday. Do you have anything to say along those lines? Well, you know, for me, every day is Earth Day. So I like to say that whenever Teal thought, now I recognize Earth Day is a great moment. It's a great moment for coverage, media coverage of these issues. The Biden administration clearly thinks it's an important uh, event because they're planning a lot of programming around it, including this summit that they're doing, international summit. I guess what I'd say, you know, I'm not a communications expert, so I'm not sure anybody would come to me for communications advice. I, I, I just can reflect on what I see when I'm out and about. And um, I think there are a lot of constituencies and communities across the country that would respond to um, an agenda for renewable and other forms of clean energy because they're good for economic development and because they're in the interest of their state or community economically. Like they're a way to make money and provide good jobs. And there are lots of communities that respond to the idea that we need to be competitive internationally and competitive in particular with China, for example, which is, you know, clearly ahead on things like solar technology and battery technology. And if we want to be positioned for leadership in the 21st century and for you know, being competitive internationally, we need to make these investments and make this change. I think those kinds of arguments can be persuasive in different communities and constituencies that don't really respond to points about climate change. And unfortunately, I think climate change itself has become a polarizing ideologically divisive issue when it should never have been. Um, obviously, there were certain interests behind creating that polarization, including some in the fossil fuel industry, which I've cited before, but other industries too were behind this polarization. And it's a shame because it's a largely scientific issue that shouldn't, that it shouldn't be divisive in the way that it is, but it is, and it has become that way. And I guess what I would say is, there are lots of ways to argue for transitioning to clean energy that don't require anybody to hit somebody else over the head with what they believe about climate change. And, and I know that's not a, necessarily the popular or welcome thing to say. There are people who say, but look, it's happening. It's real, it's scientific. I want, but if you're interested in communication and you're interested in persuasion, you need to take the measure of your audience. And I think a lot of us in the expert community in the elite community on the coast, forget about the fact that we live in our own bubbles. And we really need to find a way to talk across these lines of division. So that's, I would just encourage people 
not to be so convinced they're right, that they think they know the answer on all these things, but rather what appeals to people and what language works and, and speak to folks in the language and in, in the way they, um, they can hear what they're trying to say. The other thing I just say is, and this is true of the Biden administration too, you know, in the executive order that I keep citing it to these orders that he signed, the second one of them includes a commitment. Oh, I forget which one. So forgive me if I can't pinpoint it. But in one of the orders, there's a commitment to create a task force on how to assist the communities that will be hardest hit by transition to clean energy. You know, communities dependent on coal, dependent on fossil energy. And if you don't have some sympathy for that, that there will be losers in the clean energy economy and there needs to be support and assistance so that there is a just transition, just in lots of ways, just for historically overburdened communities, minority low-income populations that have borne the disproportionate brunt of pollution and other environmental degradation over time, but also just for the communities that will bear the brunt of a transition. If you don't have sympathy for that and can't fit your policy around that and into that, um, there will be a problem. So I would just invite people to think that that has to be part of your clean energy plan is how you're gonna provide for a just uh, and fair transition. Well, in spite of, of your, um, your argument that you uh, are not a climate communication expert, you just provided some really, really great recommendations for everybody. So um, we will second everything you just said about that. Um, and just as we wrap up here, Professor Freeman, are there any, is there any last comment that you'd like to make before, before we adjourn? Well, I would like to make a comment. I feel very optimistic. Um, you know, I'm happy that Biden won, of course. I, I, it's no uh, secret that I thought the Trump administration was devastating on all the issues I care about, including civil rights and fundamental commitment to democracy and the rest. So I, I'm very pleased that we have a new federal administration that seems to be highly competent. And I'm very pleased like all of us that we're seeing the vaccine rollout and we're gonna come out of this terrible, terrible period of COVID um, and economic disaster and the rest. Uh, so I'll, I'm optimistic for all this, but I'm, I'm really optimistic about the innovation that is coming, the creativity. If you're young on this call, you ought to be really excited, you know, about all the, the, the business opportunities that you could be part of in technology and innovation around clean energy. Um, there are so many opportunities to be in finance and do good while you're in finance, you know, investing, um, socially responsibly uh, investing. Um, you can be a banker, you can be uh, a PE, you can be in private equity, and you can still care about these issues. You, you can sort of be anything in the economy and still have a connection to and a commitment to these issues. I think if you want to be a lawyer, I mean, I train lawyers at Harvard Law School, there's so much good work to do. So I, I'm feeling very optimistic that the future is full of opportunity and innovation and creativity. And I hope that people, not just the young people, but especially the young people uh, will feel that coming out of this really tough, tough period. So I leave you with optimism. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jody Freeman, and for sharing your expertise and insights with us. And thanks to all of you who joined us today for this conversation. Um, we have recorded this. We will post this um, video on our YouTube channel. So if you wanted to reflect further or, or go back and catch something that maybe you didn't catch the first time, you'll be able to do that. And um, also, we hope that you'll join us for the annual public lecture series, which will be all virtual again this year, um, happening June 14th through 18. You can check out madcapinstitute.org for the list of lectures as they're posted. So with that, we'll wrap this up. Thank you again and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.